the Lab Creation launch party. My name is Zane Beeble, and I'm an assistant professor of English here at NSUC, and I'm so glad to see everybody here. I know this is a very culturally rich night in Carlsbad, so thank you for coming to see us. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming to the launch party for the third edition of Lao Creation, which is the NSUC student publication. Um, I just want to give you a little note on the program tonight. We will be enjoying readings from the class, um, the students in the class, and we're going to have a Q&A session after that, just to let you know. Um, there's food in the back, which I hope you guys are enjoying, free books over there. Um, the volume you will hold in your hands is the product of a semester's worth of work, sorry, semester's worth of hard work on the part of the student creators in the fine arts publication class. We're featuring art and writing from members of the class, as well as submissions from artists and writers in the community and on, and on campus here at NSUC. The theme this semester was the otherworldly. We were called to this theme in part from the last publication, which included a few works that my co-teacher, Tiffany Pascal, grouped under the heading The Otherworldly. I was drawn to this as a theme because it seemed that it would push everyone out of their comfort zones. The Otherworldly can encompass many different genres, from science fiction to fantasy, from horror to lyric poetry. In this publication, you will find works that blur the lines and take you, as a reader or viewer, into a different realm. The joys and terrors of childhood, which can be a truly otherworldly place, to the most mundane of afterlives, which I won't spell that for you, but um, <laughs> Joshua. Um, well, we, we visit the mindscapes of heroes, and we dip into the darkest places full of horrors. The otherworldly as a theme created a space for imagination and exploration. I'm very pleased with the results of this semester-long exploration. Our students push the boundaries, exploring new genres and techniques. Uh, we're featuring our first graphic story in these pages, which is projected here behind me, which was very exciting. And um, the creators of the, the graphic story really learned a brand new set of skills while they were developing it. Many of our artists are displaying work in the room, and I encourage you to check it out and even contribute to these young artists' careers slash bank accounts uh, by purchasing some pieces. I'm really proud of the work on display in these pages, and as always, I'm inspired by the bravery and passion of our students and of those who submitted work to the publication. I'd like to thank my co-teacher, Tiffany Pascal. Um, we are lucky to have a fruitful and pleasant collaboration for over two years, which that just cracks me up, it's funny, um, the way I wrote that. I know this publication would not exist without her, and that's very true. Very, very true. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Mark, Mark Buckles for his continued support for this endeavor and the administration here at NSUC as well. Thank you for joining us on this journey to the strange, the wonderful, the dark, the otherworldly. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm Damien Kelly Bateman. I'll be your MC for this evening's proceedings. And Ms. Kristen is going to be starting the evening off with Transformed. Street hunter. Yeah, yeah, okay, you're a purple butterfly. I said as I walked into the cluttered kitchen making a sandwich. Auntie Kristen, I'm a purple butterfly. Hunter yells as he runs around the living room, bumping into the couch and every chair that he passes by. Okay, Hunter, you're a purple butterfly. I say frustrated by him being so loud and talking so much. I hear a loud banging noise in the other room. I run back into the living room. There's no sign of him. I look in his room. He isn't there. I look in my mom's room. He isn't there. Finally, I checked the bathroom, and there it was. The shower rod and gray curtain were on the floor. There is a large toddler-sized cocoon hanging right over the blue bathtub with sounds like whining coming from it. The cocoon oddly smells like him, right before a bath. A sweaty, dirty little boy excited to play. I wonder how, how I'm going to explain this to his parents. Nessa runs inside, leaving the screen door to slam shut. I can't hear the metal ringing through the house because she's yelling, looking for Hunter. I yell at Nessa to shut up and told her I found him. 
We stare at the peculiar, dark brown cocoon, solid but smooth. It is so tightly spun that I'm sure that if we try to open it, we won't be able to. We leave him there as we stare up for hours studying the cocoon. The next day we get ready, staring at the cocoon. We eat, staring at the cocoon. And Joe and Nessa even call into work to stare at the cocoon. That night, when I check on the cocoon before bed, it appears slightly looser and larger than the night before. Weeks went on like this, staring at the cocoon, it growing looser and larger by day. One day, we decided we had to keep going. We know he is okay, so we have to keep going with our lives. We all go back to work. Joe goes back to work fixing computers. NASA goes back to work taking pictures. Mom goes back to work banking, and I go back to work writing. When we get home that night, we go and stare at the cocoon. It's different now. Broken open and nothing but clear slime and pungent decaying smell, isn't it? The strong smell of sweat, dirt, and decay radiates from the empty cocoon, making it obvious that there is a large amount of moisture in it. We go on a hunt, a hunt for a hunter, looking through rooms, closets, and even cabinets. When the squeaky door screen, when the squeaky screen door slams, the bell rings through the house for the last time. We all realize that we have found him, a large, toddler-sized butterfly. The butterfly has black on its body and around the edge of its wings. White spots over the black, and the inside of the wings are the prettiest purple I have ever seen. Nessa goes inside and makes sugar water for Hunter to drink. Joe starts on a concert, sorry, uh, conservatory for Hunter to live in. Mom goes to make a butterfly bush, and I sit down and read to the new Hunter. As I read, Hunter lands on me. He climbs around on me until he finds a comfortable spot on my lap, as he has many times before. Now, Kristen will be followed up with Body Shaping, read by Ashley. She wouldn't want me to be a laughing stock. Car in park, I rested my forehead on the steering wheel. His body is not feeling so hot. In fact, I had a strong chill. To look, to a, a too close look in the rearview mirror told me I was beginning to turn a little green. All the BYOB shindigs were the same. Show up without a, a suitable host body and meet the bottom of the bouncer's boot. Body was, after all, the second B in BYOB. George didn't answer me. He was only ahead. He just sat there on the passenger seat, staring that vacant, I wish I had a body, stare. I knew exactly how he felt. If only he had held on better to the one he had, we'd be sharing it right now. Fine, I'll try one more store. You stay here. I left George in the car and went back into the mall. We've been here all day with no success. They just don't keep as long as they used to, bodies. A day or two with the system shut down and they start to smell, stiffen. I've tried everything I can think of, short of letting the human soul stay trapped in the human body. That would never do. I've heard of some. A convulsive shiver ran down my spine. Just the thought of sharing a body gave me the heebie-jeebies. No, that was a line I was not willing to cross, standards and all. It would be immoral. The old way would have to do. Once inside, I could convince the brain to leave its circular, circulatory system going for a few days like a rat, ra a rat running a race with no end. Plump lips, skin pulled to the t height of elasticity, I subtly googled a woman for which I held the door. There was a fine specimen. Female snatchers had it made. Inside and out, those bodies were so pumped full of preservatives, saved just for us. Either way, we were all much better off on Earth than we had been on Saturn. The natives there held onto those slimy bodies for dear life, barbaric creatures. Biting my lip to hide a chuckle, I moved into the body shop. My hopes were so high that a steroid pump dude would come in looking for a vitamin in the vitamin store for his protein at any moment. That's where I settled my now straw-shaped body, in the bodybuilding section. If only George's body hadn't been so big. 
I wouldn't have had to be so picky. Even better, if Angie hadn't been so overzealous in acquiring this suit for me. I was going to have to find an enormous man to fill the suit he'd worn. His shoulders were a good 22 inches. He could easily squish the narrow frame I now owned. But, that was, but there was no resisting what was inside of it. The hard part is convincing the body that you're leaving to give you up. Pull up and lift in all the right places. The best, but not the only way for the soul to vacate the shell was through the belly button. And I'm a ghost image above the man falling to the tile floor. A body without a soul has no reason to continue. I pull away gently for, the re for less resistance, prying myself away at the edges. It was a smooth exchange, soul for soul, breath for breath. As I slipped easily inside my new hive, through the belly button, nostrils, mouth, original soul slipped out around me, escaping like air. There wasn't even time for anyone to notice the small man lying on the floor, the man that used to be me. Help, the new man, the new man called at the checkout to the car to the checkout desk. His voice was deep throaty boom, and I instantly regretted my volume. No need to alert the whole mall. I just needed to be sure that this big guy wasn't suspected of foul play. That happened often, but it wasn't a big deal. Once taken in for questioning, the snatcher would just change bodies again. They'd find out that the brain had just stopped functioning. He didn't even suffer, James. That had been his name. I'll be taking that. I removed the cap from his head and put it on my new one. Snug, I'd need to borrow George's when I got back to the car. What's your name, sir? Huh? That was a first. I actually had no idea. The unveiling of a new name was like Christmas morning. Somewhere along the way, this snatching had lost the air of anticipation. Either that, or I was losing my edge. It took a minute to remove the wallet from my workout shorts. This guy's hands were huge. Dude. I had a feeling he'd say dude. Well, what do you know? The new name on my ID threw me in for a loop. Sir? Oh, excuse me, officer. My new, er, I mean, my name is George. Forking over, the forking over the driver's license, I began to go, or I had gotten much of a look. I hadn't gotten much of a look. It, began e it became easier than trying to make something up. Wouldn't George get a kick out of that when I got back to the car to tell him? Well, not a kick exactly. He had no legs. Sticking around, just in case they needed a statement, I rummaged through my, the weightlifting section. I only needed supplies to maintain this guy for a few days, but it was good research. That's it, sir. You can be on your way. Thank you. Oh, no problem at all, officer. It's just strange, isn't it? I cried for a reaction. He didn't seem overly concerned, just tired. Not the kind of call I get every day. Have a nice weekend, sir. Hand shaken, back padded, this guy was looking like a hero. At best, I'd witness someone die and call a clerk. At worst, I was a murderer, though they had no reason to suspect. This little man's heart had just simply stopped beating. Back at home, my very own, not George's, not the little guy's, or not the little guy's, I'd already forgotten his name, and certainly not the new George's. Pictures of a wife and kids in his wallet made it obvious how awkward that would be. But the picture of his girlfriend made it easier to sever ties. No need for them to know his soul had moved on. Like a glove, it was always a perfect fit. No matter the size and shape of the body, the dimensions of the soul were always the same. The suit was a fine fit, too. Angelina would be pleased. Time to party. And that's going to be followed by Encrypted with Steven. of evening skies in winter, the taste of water, the feeling of direct sun in summer, or a knife blade just before it's about to break skin, the smell of cased dust on old furniture, or of childhood books long abandoned, the meaning all the words I know carry, the evoked emotions from all the songs I hear. They are all my own little secrets, locked inside this skull. Secured in a code only I know how to read, but can never explain despite a lifetime of familiarity. They are more trapped there than in any fortress 
but fly freely through my head without effort, sometimes flitting quicker than light, and at others slower than a melting glacier. They are constant, yet ever-changing, my rock that is never quite solid. The memories of all I've experienced, who I am, and what everything is, are all contained within less than half of a cubic foot, tucked safely away in white and gray. All that I know is known by every other person, but how all that I know is a secret I can never tell. Thank you. Everyone's been waiting for it. This is the one that Zane hinted to during her speech, and now we're going to be followed up with Spectral Mayhem, read by Josh. So to you, this is what would happen if I actually died. <clears throat> Whoa, my body feels light as air. If I don't get high, what's going on? I'm surprised that, that it hurts as much as it usually does. When I fall, it hurts. I mean, that's the normal thing, right? As I turn around, my face drops in shock with the sight that is right before my eyes. No, no. That can't be happening. This must be a dream. There's no way that this could have happened. What I had seen was my body on the floor, surrounded by paramedics with bright red, red liquid pulling on the, on the curb. Wait, what happened? As I had asked that question, the police officers that showed up to investigate were in, the, in an uproar of laughter over the cause of death. Are you serious? Did I die in such a lame way? How did I die, may I ask? Well, I'm not going to tell you because it's extremely embarrassing. But apparently an item from Mario Kart came to life while I was running in the park, and it's the reason I'm now dead. Man, this is so lame. Even after death, people are going to make fun of me, especially on the internet. I need to leave this place before they call the people who knew me, because I don't want to see the face of those who cry, or even worse, laughter because of this lame death. Man, it sucks that I died the way I did. Couldn't I at least die cold death, like pushing someone out of the way of a vehicle, or getting hit like that? Nope, I'm gonna remember as a loser who's dead to me on a top 10 list of, of a YouTube video. <laughs> well, now that I'm dead, I guess I'll just wait for Jesus to come back. I wonder what type of stuff I can do as a ghost now, I mean, can I do the same things as Danny Phantom, or my power is as lame as my death? Well, I guess nothing ventured, nothing gained. Arm stretched forward with my left eye shut to focus on a tree about 10 feet away. I tried to shoot ectoplasm and made a concentrated beam from the palm of my hand. Ha! Ha! Nothing happened. <laughs> Man, TV shows make me, make them, oh, sorry, and movies make being a ghost way more fun than what it is. At least no one is around to see or hear that, because if there's a way to die as a ghost, that would definitely be it. I wonder if I could at least fly. I mean, I don't have a physical body holding me down anymore, right? Jumping in place as high as I could to only realize that after five minutes, I gave it no air time. I started thinking that I had to activate flight by saying specific words. I mean, I was serious at first, but seeing that I was going nowhere, I started joking around saying things that comic book heroes would say when they flew. I tried Superman's up, up, and away to the human torches flame on. Don't judge me as if you never thought about flying before in your life. I was desperate, okay? Okay, so I can't shoot energy beams and I can't fly. The only thing left is to try scaring people. I walked a couple of blocks from the park to, to Walmart with a hint of disappointment in the air as everything I thought about, I knew about ghosts was a lie. This is my last chance to redeem myself as a ghost. If I can't at least scare one person at Walmart, then I should just give up being a ghost. And I don't even know how to do that. <laughs> I finally reached the parking lot and the grin began to grow on my face as there was still hope. Entering the building, there was people enjoying the industrial air conditioner as it was around 97 degrees when I died. Where should I go first? I think we'll go try the kids' aisle. There should be adults and kids there. I get a two-for-one deal. Walking past the aisle for 30 minutes, there's no one around, not even the workers. This is weird. I thought at least one worker would be here. Oh no. It's a school day. People won't be here till later in the day. Ah, I thought this time would be good. I guess there's no use crying over spilled milk. I'm gonna try moving to the next section of the electronics since I at least see people there. I know ghosts and movies can mess with electronics, but is that true for me? I mean, I can't do anything as a ghost. How do I even mess with the frequency? I think I just need to put my hand through it. And the first attempt to, to stick my arm through the TV was a success, although I won't lie, I was very hesitant in case it didn't work. Well, being intangible works, but that, isn't really, that didn't really help interfere with the electronics. 
I just passed through. I was already I was already frustrated and ended up getting into a slap contest with the TV, hoping that the increased speed would cause some problems. <sighs> Nothing I did work. I tried walking through the TV, screaming at the top of my non-existent lungs, and I tried using the power scheme, hoping that it would help work against the electronics. I just want to die. Being a ghost is terrible. I'm alone. I can't even do anything fun. I'm going to try one more place before I'm done here and just wander the earth forever. The last place I want to hit is the grocery house, since it's never empty. Trying to pump myself up, I left the, to prepare myself for this last mission, this being how I decided to live the rest of my ghostly life. I tried developing a game plan. What would be better, juggling the produce or picking a few up and letting them drop? Walking back and forth the area suddenly caught my eye, something that brought absolute terror in my body. The non-existent color of my spectral, spectral presence led me to where other ghosts wouldn't even be able to see me. Spine tingling, my body refusing to move, as the memory of my death kept flashing back. The thing that killed me was right before my eyes, and I couldn't even move. No. Why did I even come to this aisle? In front of me was a yellow menace that I hated even more before I died. There are times when you lose first to Mario Kart, and I just didn't like the way it tasted in general. The things in front of me were bananas. Some jerk in a red Camaro tossed it right in front of me and out of the window this morning, and they were the reason I slipped and cracked my head on the asphalt. Before I realized it, I started to hear screams from the produce aisle. Wait, what's happening? Astonished, I realized that I finally felt accomplished as the fruits and vegetables in the area were all floating above the shells, blocking the light from the area. I did it! I did it! Ma'am, I wasn't even trying to make everything flow. I was too caught up in remembering how I died. Wait a minute. When everything started floating, I remembered how I died and was angry at who killed me. Is the secret to my power having mouse in my heart? I don't know if I'm going to keep using this, but one for sure, I'm getting some revenge. Sticking my arm out, I focused on bringing a bundle of bananas to me as I had a new destination to be. And now we'll have Withered Graves read by Krista. take over the graves, loving families cleaning and decorating most of their loved ones on every occasion and holiday. Dia dos, Dia dos Muertos has to be my favorite day of the year. It is also, it is so amazing to see so many people honoring their relatives that have passed. Brilliant colors, light, and lights flood the cemeteries and food lay upon the graves. I suppose I love the thought of not being forgotten and loved by family. Leaves are scattered across the ground, and I'm watching as people frantically clean over the graves of their loved ones. I continue to look at the beautiful graves nicely decorated. I come across a depressing sight. A grave that has been seemingly deserted and withered from, so withered from rain you can barely read the name. No one has cared to clean or care for this grave, as if some poor soul had been forgotten. I try to brush the leaves off the grave, but my hands just pass through. Although this grave is broken and unsalvageable, it still calls home to me. Welcome home. And now we will have Tickling Hands, read by Sabrina. Sometimes parents are wrong. Sometimes teachers are wrong. Sometimes the only thing that is right is magic. As a child, I would whisper to the fairies. They were probably just the headlights in front of us, reflecting on my window, but I saw magic. Fairies are funny little creatures. They were there to keep me company when my parents were busy with my troublesome brother for their own problems that I didn't know were happening. The fairies were there when my father told me that I could walk on the crosswalk in front of the elementary school, that the cars would stop for me, but there was something holding onto my ear that told me to wait, despite my father, this man that I listened to all of the time, that I strived to please, telling me to go, but I didn't. And when the huge white SUV raced just feet from me through the school zone, my father turned home and left with the realization that it could have shown me to my death. The fairies did not leave, though. They simply flew away or vanished. I wouldn't pay attention to come back another day. 
This is Soto handing me a small, black handled paring knife that I held unknowingly in my ten-year-old hands, and a kiwi that was slippery with the water that had just washed it. She became frustrated that I could not correctly skim the fuzzy fruit that would years later make my throat tickle and, a, and tongue buzz. I was past the point of whispering to the fairies, but they didn't give up on me. They still softly sighed the warning that I would cut myself to ribbons with a sharp blade. The teacher took it, the teacher took it from my hands annoyed, but my clumsy self later would hardly make it out of culinary without a band aid. At 16, I had to reteach myself how to drive. A year before, I had a driver's education teacher that looked and acted like a goblin, who scared me so badly that I refused to drive for a year, hence the reteaching. The fairies would loudly be repeating that I couldn't drive well enough, that the roads were too dangerous, as they held onto my earlobe with their tickling hands and ghosts of wings. I had to shoot the creatures away when I was relearning in my grandmother's little red Ford Focus, but sometimes they didn't become helpful. They were still there when my mom insisted that the car wouldn't hit us, but I didn't go, and they shot by us like they were racing something invisible. The fairies still come back. Mostly they're there to make myself doubt my abilities and choice of friends, asking me whether I really am loved by those who say so at 2 a.m. or if I really am good enough. Over the years, I've had fairies lead me to the right path. Breaking up with someone who wasn't worthy of me, not dyeing my hair purple, not changing the song on my phone just as a cop pulls around the corner. I still have a bit of magic following me around, but often I have to ask myself if the fairies are hindering or helping me. And sometimes I refuse to listen. And now we'll have the mermaid read by yours truly. Lizzie was a young and ambitious mermaid, although she was different from the other mermaids. She didn't have a slim body like the rest of the mermaids. Lizzie was often made fun of by the other mermaids. Lizzie let this get to her and spent many hours crying on the ocean floor. She dreamed of being beautiful like the other mermaids. She wondered how different her life would be if she looked like the other mermaids, who were what she considered to be beautiful. Lizzie swam to her best friend, Carter the Merman. She confided in him and told him her plan to go to the sea hack to ask to make her beautiful. Carter told Lizzie that this was a silly idea, and at first she got mad. Carter said, hear me out, Lizzie. You don't need to go to the sea hack to be beautiful because you are beautiful. I love you just the way you are. And if you go to the, the hag and trade away a part of you to change, you will not be the Lizzie that is my best friend and the Lizzie that brings light and a twinkle to my life. Lizzie burst into tears and then charged toward Carter, giving him a big hug. Carter, you are the best friend a mermaid could have. She hugs him again. So it comes to show you that not all mermaids are the same, and that just because a mermaid is different doesn't mean that she is not beautiful. Like Lizzie the mermaid, we all have to look deep within ourselves to find the part of us that we love. Often it is hard for us to see the good parts of ourselves. Sometimes it takes a friend to show us that we are beautiful just the way we are. So for all of you friends out there, if a friend of yours are thinking about changing themselves, take time to show them how beautiful they are. Thank you. And now we're gonna be having a selection of Victoria read by that. I'm so sorry about that. standing over me in bed. Amy? Amy, get up. We can't find Victoria. She leaves my room. I sit up for a moment and stretch. The, world, the words mull in my mind and finally form into horror. Victoria is missing. I throw back my comforter and stand up. The freezing air in the room shocks my senses, but I push through it. I throw on an old pair of boots. I root around and find my clothing. I take my heavy coat and feel for the pocket knife inside the corner pocket and put it on. By the time I reach the top of the stairs, Mom and Dad, Grandma and Grandpa, and Cousin Andy are all already up. What's going on, I ask, going over to Andy first in the living room. We both know better than to try to listen in on the adult conversation in the kitchen. Didn't matter what the law said, they still didn't consider us ready to handle things. I'm not sure, I mean, I don't know how much your mom told you. Not much. I figured, don't blame her. It's just the officer and her coming out. Anyways, I guess your dad woke up this morning to do chores. 
which Tori always helps with, right? And she was just gone. I glanced at the clock on the wall. It's nearly six, which meant Dad had been up and known that she'd been missing for at least two hours now. How long have you been up, Andy? I asked, although his bedhead tells me not long. He's my age, and only a bit taller, with the sandy blonde hair that most of the family wears, except for my father and I. Maybe 30 minutes? I didn't say anything, but I must have made a face. Amy, you know why they didn't tell you right away. They didn't want to stress you out. She's my fucking sister. I need to be stressed out. I keep my voice low so that I don't interrupt the conversation in the room over. The only thing worse than trying to speak in the adult conversation is interrupting it. He nods. I know, but you also know that she's done this before. I think they wanted to give it a while, see if she wandered back like last time. We sit in silence for a moment until my dad calls us over to join the group. Amy, he says, I'll assume Andy filled you in. We're going to start by scanning the back 40 where y'all were playing yesterday. He continues to give us the plan like marching orders. It's like they say, you can take the man out of the military. My grandmother looks at me. Now, were you down by Old Miller's Pond or by Atchison Creek? Because there's about a bigger difference between the two. I think we were down at Miller's. My father gets up. All right, we have a plan. We walk out the door in a single file line, and everyone takes a moment on the mud porch to bundle up. I notice my, grab, my dad grab his 12 gauge, for just in case. When everyone's ready, we set off to the most western corner of the family farm. It's still a little dark out, and the sun is just lazily stretching over the hill to break the blackness into the familiar dull gray of a January morning. The gravel of the driveway gives out to the crunching of dead grass with the occasional slow swish of mud. It's been a dry January, but the patches of the last snow could still be seen or stepped in if not careful. And as we're walking, Andy avoids my eyes. What are you thinking about, I ask. You remember that story Grandpa told us about the woman in the lake? Well, yeah, why? Well, I remember helping him tell that story to Tori. Grandpa liked to tell us his version of an old German fairy tale. He used to say that our grandfather was chosen by a lake siren when he still lived in Germany. Normally, to be chosen was to be eaten by the siren. Our great-grandpa was cunning, though. He was able to convince this spirit, Hertha, that it was in her best interest to spare him. In return, he brought her here with him and transferred her into the cow pond by pouring in some water from her pond in Germany. It was a silly old story meant to keep us away from the cow pond. He'd say that if you got too close, you'd be snatched by Hertha's, Hertha's icy hand. At snatched, Grandpa would have someone waiting behind us to grab us. The kids always jumped and he would laugh. It was a family tradition and a rite of passage to be told that story. And Andy must have played the hand for Victoria while I was away. I look over at Andy. Okay, so? Well, I just think Victoria would know better, you know? Like, she's heard the story, and your dad's talked with her about not wandering off. She just seems smarter than that. She's only ten, Andy. Ten-year-olds do dumb things all the time. That's true. By the time we crest the last hill, the sun is already well risen, and the light glints in fractals off the ice on the top of the water of Old Miller's. The overturned silo to the left of the pond that's held so many childhood memories now looks dead and jagged. The trees to the other side that Andy and I had spent so many afternoons climbing on seem more like monsters than the jungle gym of our childhood. As we get closer, we see that there's something out on the ice. A few steps more, and I can see that it's actually a small hole. It's got a little snow pile around it. No one says anything. Nothing needs to be said. The weather lately is enough to freeze only a thin top layer. Children fall through all the time in the winter. My dad turns to us all. Stay here. I'll look up ahead. My mother speaks up. Dan, shouldn't I go ahead with you? Grandma says no. Let him go ahead, Becky. My grandmother may not be military, but the secluded farms in northeastern Kansas didn't grow weak women. No one needs any more explanation than Grandma gave, and we're all rooted to where we stand. Dad carefully walks down the little hill into the valley where the pond is. He takes his time walking slowly to the far side where the hole is. His eyes seem to fix on every one of his own steps as, we, as he takes it. We don't use this pond much. Every once in a while, a younger one wants to see it just to see it. 
It also tends to be a place for us older ones to sit and talk over a bottle of whatever we can get our hands on. Because we so rarely use it, the grass is shim tall and wild and littered with the occasional beer bottle. Damn it, I thought Andy picked those up last night. My dad takes a deep breath and carefully steps out on the ice. He slowly looks down into the hole. He cleans some of the snow around it with his sleeve and looks again. He kneels down on his hands and knees on the ice and looks one more time. He stands up and then kicks the rest of the snow away in a wide circle around the hole. He looks at us and shakes his head. My dad walks back where he previously had in the grass. She's not there. I think we all need to find out around the pond and start looking. She easily could have gotten cold or scared and hidden somewhere. You guys start looking. Amy, honey, honey, come over here and talk to me for a minute. My mom walks over to the grass and starts stamping through like Dad has done. Grandma and Grandpa go to the left to look through the old overturned grain silo, and Andy goes to look into the trees on the right. And I'm standing here with my dad. How are you handling things, kid? Didn't matter how old I got. I was always a kid, especially after last summer. I'm okay, Dad. I mean, I'm worried like everybody else. I hold my arms to my chest. Why is my heart beating so fast? Okay, you took your pill this morning, right? Of course I did. I'm not stupid. My breath is giving a small telltale rattle, and I feel every muscle aching to, tempt up, to tense up. Not an attack. Not now. Don't snap at me. I was just making sure. Well, I'm fine. Good. He stomps back down the hill to join my mom, and I decide to join, join Andy in the alcove of trees. We spend two hours down at Old Miller's without a sign of Victoria before we resign ourselves to head back to the house for supper. And now we will be having a reading of Dear Dr. Victor by Shiloh. to blow off to think about whether or not the person I'm writing to gets this letter or not. If you ask me, I beg you to get this even if I don't find that thing for it. Anyway, I wanted to write about a serious dilemma. The world's gone mad. And not I don't mean like those guys down the street with crazy hair and tie-dye shirts. I mean world-changing mad. Mary Garrett said she saw old Jimmy Rocks Roxette in her attic. And just the other day, Dan Oakley showed up, um, one of Dan Oakley's showcase pots flew up and smashed on the back wall. He said he saw Rob, his dead business partner, do it. Constantly saying, doors and mazes, doors and mazes. Have you seen him lately? Have you gone to school with him there recently? Doors and mazes. You don't think he could be talking about your door, could he? Look, Zan. I know you've been in the afterlife for over three years now. That's six semesters. You've got to have learned something substantial by now. I'm starting to question every coincidence that I see. You're still there, right? I mean, everyone else seems to have come back. Anywho, I hope you're fine wherever you are. Remember, John. Dear Dr. Victor, I'm looking for jobs. I got fired after my boss found his computer in the dumpster. I obviously didn't do it. I'll play the occasional office prank on him, but I'd never do something like that. He didn't believe me, though. Tough luck, am I right? Oh, and I found that door. It was at the bottom of my coffee mug one morning. No doubt you or someone else has read the letters by now. Doors and mazes. I keep thinking about what Rob said. I don't think he meant your door, Sam. It must have been something else. Something he saw or had seen. Maybe from the afterlife. Do you have doors and mazes in the afterlife? I'm tired, so I think I'll go to bed now. I can't stop thinking about Rob. He's still there, I think. Saying doors and mazes. Well, night things. Remember, John. <coughs> Dear Dr. Victor, I had a or I got a job at the factory. I'm supposed to watch the cameras from the middle of the cargo area. Or camera. There's only one camera in the entire factory. It 
It's focused on the hallway to my right. Weird, huh? So far, no one's come back from the afterlife to come here. Though, it'd be great to have the company. I keep hearing noises from the assembly room. Maybe it's one of them. If I... If only I could go check, but... Alas, I'm too lazy. Besides, this donut ain't gonna eat itself. I've been wondering. There are plenty of doors here, and the whole place is practically a maze. So what if Rob meant the factory? Honestly, he probably had no idea what he was thinking about. He could have meant anything. I'm getting paid overtime tonight, so I gotta go. Remember, John. Alright, so I'm starting to see lights and stuff coming from the assembly room. They aren't very bright, but they float around the factory sometimes. I've hidden every time they've come into the room, just in case. I'm starting to piece together some of the evidences of different sightings of the dead. You know, your people. Anyway, I've come up with a pretty solid theory on what's happening. If my theory's correct, I'll let you know. Remember, John. Success! I've tried touching one of them and it passed right through my hand. The thing is, the thing is though, every once in a while I get another flash of light from the assembly area. I'll go and see what's, go what's going on. Hang on, hang in there for a second. No way! I looked in there and there's some kind of big floating blob of uh, yellow goopy stuff. It's flowing like water on the surface, but it looks like there's someone in there. It's also really cold in there. I'll grab our old lab stuff from the attic and run some tests tomorrow. Luckily, this thing disappears in the day, so the morning guy won't find it. Remember, John. I've been able to get all the stuff to the factory, but I can't keep hiding it in the broom closet. I mean, sure nobody uses that closet, but it still damages some of the equipment. And I can't keep it under the desk, because too bad. I wasn't able to touch the goo stuff, but I was able to catch a bit of it in a beaker. If I isolate the solid bit of whatever it is, I should be able to evaporate the rest and look at its chemical compound. I, it, it could just be some kind of bioluminescent organi or organism, but my hypothesis is that it may be related to your kind. I also got a coat because it's literally like sub-zero the closer I get to the stuff. I can't wait to test, test it, but right now my computer's acting up and I can't play World of Warcraft or run the tests until I get it fixed. I'll write you back tomorrow, Zan. Remember, John. Dear Dr. Victor, I hate my stupid boss. I was let go this morning. Something about my not doing my job and something getting broken. I was doing my job just fine. It's just that stupid bloggy stuff. Oh, speaking of the goo, I was able to take the solid core out of my sample and run some tests on them separately. The thing is, Whenever I get further away from the factory, the stuff stops floating. Though, when I took it to my house, one small drop was trying to pop off and float away. Honestly, it's a little creepy. I'll write you back a letter about what I find. Remember, John. I had to break back into the factory to get the lab stuff. It was pretty easy. The new night guard was playing World of Warcraft the whole time. What an idiot. I mean, who would do a thing like that? He better not be playing on my account. Anyway, I woke up this morning to find that the screw was gone. I opened the lid to the beaker and a whole bunch of air exploded out all at once. Now I have, uh, now I have a theory, but I'm not sure how to test it. The assembly room is really cold and the air, con and air condenses when it gets cold. Maybe the hydrogen in the air was so cold it became a sort of gelatinous mass. I'm not sure what's causing it to float, though, um, but, but I bet it has something to do with your kind. The solid core, though, makes a lot of sense. It's made of carbon, pure condensed carbon. I'm glad that the goo seemed to suck the CO, carbon monoxide, out of the air and condensed it, because that stuff is deadly, especially in that large quantity. Man, I've got to go take a nap. I've been wa working on this theory all night, and I need some sleep. Remember, John. I got a uh, dear Dr. Victor. I got the job again. They told me that some recent discoveries had cleared my name, and they wanted me back. 
I'm sitting in the office with my mug door right now. I'll go ahead and test the, test the goo now that I have free access to it. Remember, John. P.S. I've been having some pretty bad headaches, so it may be hard for me to write clearly until I get it figured out. Dear Xander, I'm sorry I wrote your name informal, informally, but we've been friends since we were two, so I'm not worried about it. The headaches have been getting worse, but at least I was able to run the goo through the system and send my report into the lab. I should be getting my results back any day now. Man, if you were here, the whole, this whole process would go much faster. I went back and checked the assembly room today. The figure in the center seems to be growing. It looks very humanoid, but I'm not sure, and I'm not sure, but I think it's a girl. It looks about the same age as Rachel when she died. No doubt, but, but no doubt she's with you and Grandma in the afterlife. I can just see you guys going to school at the same time. Boy, what I wouldn't give to be a fly on that wall. I'll send you a letter whenever I get the results back. Remember, John. I think I know why I've been having these headaches. <coughs> I, got, I got the results back. Um, I got my results back, and my theory was wrong. Zan, that stuff is condensed carbon monoxide. Crap. Dear Dr. Victor, I've been running some tests, and it looks like I have an unhealthy amount of CO attached to my hemoglobin. So basically, I'm in big trouble. Well, if I'm going to go, it's going to be with me. The figure in the center of the blob is growing. It has big raven wings now, and its mouth was moving. It, it looks almost completely done, except it's completely black. When I get near it with liquid, it starts making weird shapes and floating. I'm still trying to figure out what's making it float. These little ghost-like things are, are floating around everywhere, too. They've started crowding around me, and they're so annoying. Well. I'm going to a hospital if this doesn't clear up. So, good night, Zan. Remember, John. Dear Xander, I'm in the hospital right now, but I figured out how the stuff is floating. I started hearing a ringing sound in my ear, so I recorded it and loaded the volume. The frequency was just right to make the water float in midair, but when I lowered the hertz, I could hear a voice. It seemed to be coming from the person in the blood. It was saying something about ravens and living again. Um, I'm not completely sure. Weird, huh? The doctor just walked in, so I've got to slip this through the door while he's not looking. Remember, John. Dear Xander, I don't have long to live. I can feel it. It hurts. But I'm excited. I'll be with you and Rachel. And I'll miss this weird little world. I'll see you soon, Sam. Greetings, John. When I was in third grade, I was invited to go on a hill trip to Eastern Oregon. All that was there was sagebrush, dirt, and a few hills, and a lake. There weren't any signs of civilization for miles. The place that we laid down camp was a flattened dirt area with hills surrounding it. Throughout the couple days there, I went fishing and swimming a lot. Also while there, the chaperones took us, took us hiking every morning. During those hikes, I'd look for all sorts of animals and reptiles. I saw many rabbits and lizards around during those hikes. I grew very fond of seeing those furry and scaly animals. On one of those hikes, I saw a rabbit and inched my way towards it. It let me get pretty close and I began to try to pick it up. It scurried away as I tried to extend my hands. I gave up that chase and ran to catch up with the rest of the group hiking the hills. I tried to find the same rabbit the next day, but I had no luck. However, the day after that, I saw the rabbit again. This time, it wasn't alone. It brought a friend. At least that's what I thought at the time. It was accompanied by a rattlesnake, which now had the rabbit in a warm embrace. The snake unhinged its jaws and choked down the small rabbit. The rattlesnake then slithered off. I was there, left there mortified. I stood there in shock until the group was back down the hill. They had to help me back down to the camp. I didn't sleep that night. 
I couldn't get the image out of my head. It was the most terrifying act of nature I've ever seen. Still to this day, the scene haunts me. Of course, as soon as I got slightly more comfortable than being uncomfortable, the door opened. I sat up slowly and watched the guard bring Sika to his bed. Guard 68, whose real name was Zach. He was always nicer to the kids here. The workers here aren't really allowed to show us sympathy, but he was different. He seemed to understand the pain we went through. After he laid Sika down on the bed, he looked at me and nodded. I gave a slight nod and he left, locking the heavy door behind him. I limped over to Sika, who looked to be sleeping. His left leg, which was broken yesterday and in a cast, was now all healed up and cast free. I moved some of his dirty blonde hair from his face and looked at him. He looked so peaceful sleeping. I wanted to see his pretty green eyes, but he deserved some sleep, especially after everything he went through for the last week. He may heal fast, but he feels every bit of the bone snapping back into place. He didn't get much sleep. When I pulled back and turned to go to my bed, I heard Sika say, what, no kiss for the sleeping prince? I turned to look at him and he smiled a bit. He had that smirk I had grown so fond of on his face. I just thought you deserved to get some sleep after your hell week. I sat next to him on the bed, looking at his right shoulder. He had tattoo-like symbols running from his right cheek down to almost his right elbow. It was some kind of symbol thing he got from his family's bloodline. He came from a long line of shifters, which meant he could take the shape of a few different animals. His favorite form to take was a dog-like creature. Every time he shifted, the tattoo grew. I had asked him once what they meant, but I was just met with an icy stare. I know you just love me for my tattoos and all, but my eyes are up here, you one-eyed dork. I laughed a bit and looked him in the eyes. He smiled and touched the left side of my face, running his thumb over the eye patch gently. Your eye is bleeding again. Did you disinfect it? Were you punched in the eye? Did you eat today? Did you, ow! He rubbed his cheek where I had pinched him. What was that for? I smiled and got off his bed. If I remembered more of my mom, I would say you are acting like her. I'm really fine, it's just ble it just bleeds sometimes. He hugged and I sat down on my bed. Well, yeah, well, you know what you should do? I raised my eyebrow. Use your mind abilities to turn off the lights. I'm really tired. I rolled my eye and stood up. You know, damn well I can. I wish I could control it, but I haven't been able to do anything with my abilities. You would almost think the doctors were lying and saying I have one, and they are just torturing me for nothing. I flicked the switch off and sat back down on my bed. I could see his green eyes glowing in a bit in the dark. Marcus, I read your report, and you're, you do have abilities, I swear. Even before you got here, the guards talked about how this monster child turned his house upside down with his mind. Everyone was scared to meet you. Yeah, but I haven't been able to do it. I haven't been able to use them since. No matter what they do, nothing works. Even taking my eye out didn't work. I shuddered at remembering the pain and ran my hands through my dusty hair. We took it out to see if your powers would manifest to fight back. Your eye holds the key to your power. That's what they told me after the surgery that I was wide awake for. I still have nightmares of it. I hear my screams in my dreams most nights. I really wish they hadn't taken it. Your eyes are really pretty. Purple suits you. He rolled over to face the wall. Night, Marcus. I blessed a bit and lay back down on the bed. Night, Sika. A few minutes later and I heard Sika's he'd been breathing. That guy could sleep through anything, I swear. One time during a fire drill, he had stashed himself in a janitor's closet and had fallen asleep while the alarms were still blaring. I don't know how he did it, but I was jealous. I stared at the ceiling as lying on my back hurt a lot less than anything else. The silence was soothing as I relaxed into the bed. What was life like outside the compound? Images of school, coffee shops, and bookstores crossed my mind. What little interactions we did get with the outside world came to us in the form of movies and books. I knew most of the stuff was fake, but it didn't stop me from believing I could have a normal life one day. As my eyes started to close, I heard heavy footfalls coming down the hall. It sounded like more than just a standard two or three guards that patrolled at night. Suddenly, the door unlocked and flew open. The lights turned on, blinding me for a bit. Get up, both of you, now, said a gruff voice. I swung my legs over the bed and onto the floor and looked at Sika. He was still asleep, of course. One of the guards went up to him and flung him to the floor. Sika scrambled to his feet, momentarily stunned. He looked panicked until I grabbed his arm. He looked me in the eye and calmed down a bit. We turned to the guards and waited for a command. The two that had entered the room stepped out, waiting for us to exit. Sika stepped out first and limped a bit, and I limped a bit behind him. Now out in the hall, I could see that there were about eight guards, including the two that had been in our room. 
We never had more than four guards at a time. It really unsettled me. Shooting in formation, four behind us and four in front, we began walking. We knew not to ask where we were going. That would only end up with the butt of a gun connecting with someone's nose. I looked at Sitka, but he was facing forward and slightly ahead of me. I sighed and looked ahead. I normally wasn't scared of being escorted in the middle of the night, but with so many guards, it made me wonder where, what was going on. We left the living quarters and entered the lab area. I had been experimented on in almost every room in this wing. From just getting stabbed with needles to getting my damn eye removed, there was no end to experiments here. As we continued walking, my right leg buckled from under me. I fell face first into the floor and let out a strangled cry of pain. If I screamed, the guards would just kick me. They hated loud noises. Zika was at my side in a second and put his hand on my shoulder. I had a fresh bruise there and it hurt, but not as bad as my leg. Marcus, are you okay? Can you get up? I tried to stand, but my leg hurt far too much. I collapsed under my own weight. Stand up, both of you, get up, said a guard with a deep voice. He nudged my bad leg with his boot and I flinched, trying to hold in my whimpers. Back off, dude, give him a minute to stand up. He's hurt, all right? Zika rubbed my back gently, fucking prick. Zika mumbled. I thought I was the only one that heard him, but it seemed the guard had great hearing. Was that you little shit? Huh? Say it louder and say it to my face. The guard grabbed Sika suddenly, yanking him off of me. No! I reached for him, but I couldn't go far with my leg all messed up. The guard was holding him by a shirt collar and was shaking him. The guard must have been on something because they normally didn't act like this. Say it, you little shit. What did you call me? The guard was red in the face with anger. The other guards just stood by looking in other directions or suddenly interested in the stains on the walls. I was panicking. Sika may be able to heal quickly, but it, was st it still cost him a great amount of pain. So he narrowed his eyes. I said, you're a fucking prick. He spat in his face. The room was dead silent. The guards all stood gaping at the two while I looked on in horror. The guards suddenly turned an unnatural shade of red and pushed Sitka back. Why, you piece of shit! He pulled his gun up and then that habit slung around his back before it and aimed it at Sitka. Before anyone could do anything, a shot rang out. The room was silent again, except for the ringing from the shot. Sitka made a strangled noise and fell to the ground next to me in a pile. Sitka! I moved closer to him and rolled him over so he was on his back. His eyes started around wildly for a bit until they met mine. I gaped at him trying to figure out where he, where he was hit. The blood began to pull around him quickly and I started to panic. Then I saw it. The hole the bullet had made was in his neck, more precisely cutting through his jugular. I put my hands over the wound quickly to try and stop the bleeding. It wasn't helping much. Go get a doctor! Please help him! I felt tears begin to sting my eye as I looked from my friend to the guards. They just stood there looking at us. Do something! Still, they did not move. I looked at Sika, and his eyes seemed to be losing the light I had grown so fine of. Don't you die on me! Stay with me, please! As I sniffled and pressed harder on the wounds, he let out a gurgling noise. This only caused more blood to spill out. Oh God, make it stop, please! Someone help us, please! I began to cry, blurring my already shitty vision. I wiped my eyes, smearing his blood on my face to look at Sitka again, but he wasn't moving. His eyes were blankly staring at the ceiling. I stared at him for what seemed like hours, hoping he moved. He didn't budge an inch. I felt a heavy hand on my shoulder, shaking me or trying to pull me up. I couldn't tell. I heard some noise. Was someone trying to talk to me? I don't care. Nothing matters anymore. My friend was dead. No one but me tried to save him. Then I heard a voice. The guard who shot him. Get up, kid. Don't make me shoot you, too, he said. I felt my body begin to shake. How dare he? I stared at my hands, soaked in my friend's blood. Bl blood that should have never been spilled. I suddenly felt pain behind my missing eye. Felt like my eye was still there, and it was beginning to throb. I closed my eye, hoping it would go away, that I was dreaming. I still felt his warm blood on my hands. The guard poked me with his gun, saying something again. I clenched my fist and squeezed my eye tight. The throbbing only increased. Something felt like it was trying to push its way out of my skull, through my socket. When the guard hit me in the back of the head with his gun, the energy was released suddenly. I heard a pop, then something warm splattered on my neck. I opened my eye and looked at the horrified faces of the other guards. A heavy thump came from behind me. I slowly turned my head to look, and there was a body. Not just any body, but the body of the guard who shot Sitka. But nothing. But something seemed off. Then I realized his head was missing. As I looked around a bit, I noticed his blood had been splattered about as if it was on a red paintbrush. I almost realized that I also realized that the warm stuff on my neck, quickly turning cold, was his blood. I heard several clicks and looked at the other guards. They all had their guns pointed at me. 
Some of them are shaking a bit. I'm, I would normally feel scared, maybe even pee myself. But right now, I felt nothing. I heard more noise, but didn't pay attention. I looked down at Sika's body, then at my hands. The pressure all of a sudden floor, now headless and dead. I started to pan a bit. It was too much. The energy was building up behind my eye again. With nothing left for me to release the energy on, it had nowhere to go. I wanted to scream. The pain was so excruciating. I could feel the wound opening up and blood trickle down my face after soaking the patch quickly. It hurt and I wanted it to go away. Suddenly I felt a light touch on my hand. Marcus, it's okay. I gasped softly and felt the energy leave from behind my eye to somewhere else in my body, lost for now. I looked down slowly and saw familiar, lively green eyes looking at me. He smiled slightly at me and rubbed his thumb over my hand gently. I'm here, no reason to be upset. I gave that him for a bit. Tears began to prick my eye again. I thought his smile widened. Fast healing, sorry to scare you. I just lost too much blood too fast. So my body made my heart slow down. He lifted his hand up and stroked my cheek, smearing the blood that had just been speckled before. No reason to cry. He sat up and looked around. He whistled and looked at me. He gave me the biggest smile I had ever seen him give me. You are one badass bitch, Marcus. I teared up and flung myself into his arms. He caught me with ease and rubbed my back gently. My body shook with sobs as I bawled my one eye out. I cried from what I had done, but mostly the fact that I had almost lost my only friend. We sat there, in a mix of different people's blood, just thinking of crying. I cried into his shoulder, the side that didn't have blood caked on it. I was scared of what I had done, but what, what would happen to us, but mostly the realization that if I lost Sika, I had no one. That is what was truly terrifying. Take a few questions from you guys. If you have questions for the students about their work or about the magazine, anything, any questions you guys have. I'm going to turn off the mic because I can talk loud. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> so, questions? Oh no, you're just waiting. <laughs> that is my teaching style. <laughs> yes. So, Zay, how is this one different than the other two that uh, you've done so far? I need something else to listen to. I think. <laughs> 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 it was just bad timing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can say that um, I think with each edition, we learn a lot and we refine the processes. Um, from my perspective as being like a creative writing person, I think the writing in here is the best writing that we've had. Um, it's, it's really good writing. And I think that the theme was challenging, but then when I listen, like listening tonight, everybody wrote about death, which is interesting. I guess we can't get away from that. But um, people's heads are exploding. <laughs> Murdered by bananas, like <laughs> so they're very concerned with like, mortality. <laughs> um, but I'm really pleased with how it turned out. So and I would say, in regards to the visual arts, um, one of the interesting things in this particular issue is that uh, people weren't quite as worried about um, accuracy in terms of like proportions of human anatomy because it is otherworldly, and you can kind of get away with like manipulating how the body looks and um, you know when I look at student work they're really trying hard to get everything right and it tends to look stiff and awkward so when I looked at the artwork this time there's a little bit more spontaneity and um, freedom I think because of that self-consciousness it just wasn't quite there they're like oh this is fantasy it's otherworldly we can kind of bend the rules a little bit uh, that was one of the differences I noticed just, you know. and I throw it to the students too some of you guys have taken this class multiple times um, how did, how was it different for those of you who, this is your second or third time taking it? Do you want to The reading was fast? <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah, because there wasn't really a difference for me. No? It was exactly the same. <laughs> Macy's here, so that was <laughs> the one that I think the, the class exactly a year apart is getting a semester in the middle. And I would say I've seen major differences in the way you guys have performed, the way that the course runs. I think it runs so much smoother now. The expectations are a little bit clearer. I think the first time we're figuring stuff out, but I think you guys have really great stuff now. Yeah. So we're getting better. We're just always getting better. Continuous improvement, they call that in the business. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the eight-foot joke. Um, other, two more questions. 
<laughs> Mark. This is for this is for Kristen Harrison. So Kristen, how how did uh, you come upon turning the toddler into an insect? What was that all about? <laughs> he actually, whenever he was a little bit younger, used to say that he was a purple butterfly. <laughs> So I, I decided if anybody was going to turn into anything, my nephew was going to turn into a purple butterfly, like you always said. <laughs> it's like a pleasant um, metamorphosis. Metamorphosis, yeah. 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 Well, I, I found it really chilly. You've upset me to know it. <laughs> because there's something about a toddler becoming an insect and then crawling all over you. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to forget that.
fetish and I love it. And I'm just like, hee 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 hee. I sit in the back and I just like, laugh with pure joy, happiness. Because they're having to like do the consonants and all kinds of stuff. Thank you so much, Seth. I think I, that's the thing too. Like we, I think we are growing and we're always getting better. So I'm really pleased. Um, any other questions? Um, thank you guys so much for coming. We have books. Please take a book or two or some. Um, there's probably still some food left. I don't know. I can't tell. And we have art over all around. Um, if you want to take a look. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs> yes, that's what I did. I was like, I got this penis saying last time. I am so pleased with the way everything turned out, and Josh in particular did an awesome job. So, you are awesome. No, that, it cracks me up every time I hear it. I really enjoy it. So, good job, Josh. <laughs>